Welcome to Mount Wilson Church of the Brethren. We hope you've had a good week and we hope to be encouraging for another good week. Good morning, Mount Wilson family. This morning I want to start off by reading the back of the bulletin, I am because we are. The fellowship of believers detailed in Acts sounds like the perfect relationship. I'm reading Acts 2, 44. It tells us all the Lord's followers often met together and they shared everything they had. If we follow this biblical blueprint for how to be ideal Christians, we face high expectations. Often we only see our church family at church. We are so busy with working different jobs and juggling social lives, being together with our church family more than once or twice a week may be difficult and sharing all our physical possessions seems impossible. So, how are we called to be a strong fellowship of believers despite all the challenges of modern life? There is a South African philosophy known as Umbantu, which is often translated as I am because we are. It is because, excuse me, it is best explained with the story of a social scientist who had been working in an African village. He obtained a basket of fruit and proposed a game with the children. He put the basket near a tree and asked them to race toward it. The person who reached the first would get all the fruit. To his amazement, they all joined hands and reached the basket at the same time, sharing it with one another. In explanation, they replied, how can one of us be happy if all the other ones are sad? South African theologian Desmond Tutu described Ubuntu this way. When I dehumanize you, I inexorably dehumanize myself. Perhaps our calling today is not to follow the example of Christian community found in the book of Acts so literally. Instead, we are called to be family in Christ, brothers and sisters who love each other no matter what and are united through empathy. Rather than life together and share every possession, we are called to be believers held together by a common spirit in Christ. We seek to respect and understand one another. I like that for Acts 2, 44. Uh, that in Buku. Never heard of that before, but that, I like that. to bring just a prayer of our joys and concerns for everyone because we don't know what's happening at your home. We don't know what you're concerned about. We don't know what your joys are. But we'd like to say a prayer to just keep everybody involved 
and let you know that we're thinking of you and we're praying for you. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We come not as strangers or foreigners, but we're your children and you're your, our Father. We were not part of the family at one time, but we've been born again and made part of your family. And because of that, we have the wonderful prospect of living with you through all eternity in heaven. What a bright future we have. We thank you today for your faithfulness and your mercy and your grace. You're always there when we need you. You've never turned us away and you've never failed us. You've never failed to fulfill your promises to us and to your world. In our troubles and trials and when the road seemed long, you've been right there with us and you've helped us through and we give you thanks and praise today. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us, but most of all, we thank you for who and what you are. We want to tell you that we earnestly want to do your will and fulfill your plans and purposes for us. We're available because we've surrendered our lives to you, and you can do with us whatever you choose. We're all busy with the business of living in the here and now. We have jobs, we have families, we have responsibilities, we get involved in all kinds of things, some of vital importance, and some of them are only trivial. So help us, Lord, to put first things first. Help us to keep our priorities straight. Help us to seek first your kingdom and righteousness and let the other things fall into their rightful places. Help us to make the right choices that will count for eternity. We pray for the needs of our people today. We've all come with individual and very personal needs. Maybe nobody on earth knows about the struggles and burdens that we're facing, but you know, and you invite us to bring everything to you in prayer. So we each reach out to you, and we know that you're already reaching out to us. We ask you to meet us and meet our needs this morning and give us the assurance that you're answering our prayers. We pray for many different kinds of physical needs, financial needs, and those with emotional needs. Some need healing of relationships. Whatever they are, Lord, we bring them to you because you can do something about them. We pray for our community and those that are all around us. And we pray for divine wisdom and the ability to lead justly and wisely. We pray for all those who are in the midst of this pandemic Give the doctors, nurses, and researchers wisdom and guidance to fight this unseen virus. 
Lord, it's difficult to see a way through this right now. Please provide strength and hope for everyone. We pray for a revival of godliness and righteousness and holiness in our country and for the forces of evil to be defeated. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I don't have a story for you children, for say, but I saw a message on Facebook that really spoke to me, and then I heard from a teacher this week, not realizing how much teachers are having a hard time with this, not seeing you guys, not seeing the children, that you left so quickly and nobody got to say goodbye. So this is a message I have to you that I want to share. I know there isn't one person at Mount Wilson who doesn't miss your little faces, your smiles, and your laughter. I know things have been uprooted for you. You left school without saying goodbye to your friends or your teacher. No one realized you would be going back. You wouldn't be going back. The cafeteria ladies, bus drivers, principals, school teachers really mind not seeing you. We've been applauding everyone but our children. You are our little heroes. You had to adjust from things you love to do, playing sports, playing with your friends, going to church and Sunday school. Now your parents have become your teachers and your playmates. So I had an idea. Mr. Stokes, the older man that comes to church with us, turned 91 this past week. His great-granddaughter made him a picture and mailed it to him. Well, when he opened the card up and saw her picture, his face lit up. So here is what I thought about. You crayon a picture for one of the people at Mount Wilson as a little hero. You would make their day. And then I thought, we as members at Mount Wilson, how about we write a note, send it to one of you or our youth? Let's encourage one another. Before we pray, whoever you are sitting next to, give them a hug. Give them a hug. Thank them for all they do. See, that is one of the things I miss. When we were at Mount Wilson, after the praise songs, we would greet one another and encourage each other. So till we can be together again, let's reach out to each other. Lord willing, we'll be together soon. God bless you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that we could get this message out even though we can't be together. But I pray for all our children. I know it must be tough on them. They don't understand probably all that's going on in the, and being penned in the house or just staying close to home. But I just pray that you be with each and every one. And I pray that Soon that we could get back together, I know it won't be the same, but that you would just help us to be patient and to trust you, Lord. Now we ask this in our blessed and holy name. Amen. I'll be reading Acts 2, 42 to 47, and it reads thus. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders, and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. 
And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And the word of the Lord is blessed. You heard Sydney read our text this morning from uh, the book of Acts 2, 42 to 47. And it sounds like a wonderful scene. Who wouldn't want to be a part of this family? When this whole pandemic thing was unfolding in our little corner of the world, I wasn't sure what direction we were going to go. Our last time together as a group was March 14th for our pot pie dinner. After hearing the guidance from the district leadership and from our state government, we knew we had to close. Just like that, we were gone and the building was empty. <clears throat> we sat isolated in our homes, watching the news, listening to what's going on, what's going to happen, and waiting for a miracle. The first thing that happens to me when there is something major going on is to change my routine and I sit glued to the TV watching the news. I want to learn more about what's happening and why and what to expect. I noticed that the most commonly used word was unprecedented. And after hearing it a few hundred or thousand more times, it's a word I really don't care if I ever hear again. I found it was becoming all too easy in isolating yourself and becoming depressed about the situation. Fortunately, I would occasionally force myself to get on the way to life and back to the way it is now. We need to continue in our daily routine of Bible study and prayer to stay strong in your spiritual life. So I was really uplifted when I read the scriptures uh, for this week's lectionary, and it all made so much sense. Max Lucado, one of my favorite writers, had a devotional on today's passage in Acts, and it was entitled, We're in this together. So speaking to the church, Jesus didn't issue individual assignments. He said, you, all of you, collectively will be my witnesses. Jesus works in community, will be my witnesses. For that reason, you will find no personal pronouns in the earliest description of the church in Acts. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, and to sharing in meals and to prayer. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They worshiped together and shared their meals with great joy. The cameo contains all plural nouns and pronouns. No I or my or you. We are all in this together. He's the head of the body, which is the church. I am not the body. You are not the body. We together are his body. So brothers and sisters, we are in this together. When we think about how we become a strong church, we realize that everyone has an important part in making this church strong. You mentioned the word family to 20 different people, and it's bound to elicit 20 different responses because family means different things to different people. Some people have great memories of family time spent together and laughter and love, but to others it conjures up images of fear, violence, and abandonment. And in this age of constantly shifting values, it's hard to even know anymore what defines family. But how many of you realize that God's word is immutable? That's a fancy word meaning that it does not change. God has a plan for family, and that plan does not change based on our experience or on the whims of social influence. And that also includes the family that he has designed the local church to be. So for today, I want to take a look at the second aspect of God's plan for family, that being, of course, uh, part of the family of God. So let me read you from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is from the New Living Translation. Translation. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. So just let that incredible magnitude of what Paul said there sink in for a second. You are no longer an outsider 
but because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you've been adopted into the household of God and are now family. Together, we all make up the family of God. Now, where you're at right now, turn to somebody and tell them that together we make up the family of God. And you may feel a little silly, but it's important for us to be able to do that, to acknowledge that together we here are all a part of that same family. Because as the old saying goes, you can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your family. Now turn to that same person and tell them, you're stuck with me. The problem is that just as the definition of family has become blurred in society, I believe that it has also become blurred within the family of God. To that extent, I believe some churches couldn't even identify as a family if they had to. And what a shame that is, because that's exactly what we are called to be. And we could go on and on with so many other scriptures that specifically talk about how we're supposed to act as a family. So this morning, I want to spend my time describing to you what I believe is a biblical definition of what it means for us to be family. Let's call it this list of fam family values, if you will. And then there's a distant relatives. We may never even meet some of them face to face because they live so far away, but we are still all family to each other. To do that, I want to open you to open up your book Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and beginning at verse 2. I have no doubt that you have probably heard sermons on this text before, about how the modern day church could and should be more like the New Testament church. But this morning I wanna approach it from a little different angle and I want you to see what this passage says to us about being a family. So I'm gonna use an acronym using the word family to spell out the points. So let's look at this text. In Acts 2, 42 to 47, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So we begin our definition of what it means for our local church to be a family with the letter F. And it stands for to be focused on Christ. The local church was never intended to be a social club where people of like interests could gather and develop those interests. Now, there's nothing wrong with sharing an interest in something with, with somebody else and developing a friendship over that shared thing and even spending time together exploring and doing it. Great friendships can be built over shared interests, but only a focus on Jesus Christ can develop a family kinship, the kind of family kinship that the church is called to share. That's why, as a church, everything we do, every meeting, Every program, every budget, everything has its first and primary focus of Jesus Christ. In verse 42 of our text, Luke tells us that they devoted themselves to this, and as a modern-day church family, that too is our devotion. Secondly is the A, and it stands for affirming one another. In verse 46, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There's an old story I read of an elderly deacon who was laying in the hospital for a prolonged illness. One day his pastor dropped in to visit and the deacon professed his profound disappointment with his church. He explained that despite being born and raised in this church and serving in many different capacities over the year, not one member had bothered to visit or call or even send him a note of encouragement to him while he was in the hospital. The pastor listened to all that the deacon had said, and when the man had finished, he asked him one simple question. 
In all those years of being raised in and serving the church, how many people did you visit or call or send a note of encouragement to? If Sunday's the only time that we have contact with others from the church, then we're not a family. We're just a religious institution. In John 13, 34 to 35, it says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So don't wait for someone else to take the lead. Call someone, visit someone, invite someone over for a meal. And John 13, 33 to 34 said, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I loved, loved you, so you must love one another. Okay, next I move on to the letter M, which means magnifying God in worship. Verse 47, which is a continuation of that sentence, started in verse 46, says that every day they were praising God. Every day they would spend time with each of the other members of the family. And the result in that was God would be lifted up in praise. <clears throat> now, does that mean that they had a hymn sing every time they got together? No, what it meant is that they were so focused on Christ that as they affirmed and encouraged each other, God was praised through them. Their very lives magnified God, made God larger in the eyes of others and easier to see. Singing is a great way to praise God, but there's so many others. Serving breakfast to kids at a public school is a great way to praise God. Packing Christmas shoe boxes is a great way to praise him. Sharing a piece of pie with someone else is a great way to praise God. So let me put it another way. The reason that we use the worship software in our worship service is because while we can worship with just the piano, having the other instruments adds a fullness that you can't get from a single instrument. Well, perhaps you've heard this expression before, before but you are an instrument of worship. You were designed and made so that your life can magnify God. But when you join with others who are also instruments of worship, it brings a fullness that you could never have on your own. It's great to hear someone sing, how great thou art. But I can tell from personal experience that it's more powerful when several hundred voices join together to sing it. It's great when one person sets up a float but it's also powerful for many other people to join it to make that happen. The next letter is I, which means that as a family, we're always imagining new ways to love the lost. A church that exists to serve only the needs of its people is a church that's already dead. As a family, it's our desire to see the family expanded that draws us together in unity. We all have different tastes in music and in decorating and what color is our favorite and so on. But if those were the cement binding our church together, there's no way that we could last. I want you to notice something interesting at the end of verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice how it doesn't say that God added to their number every Sunday. Daily people were getting saved, and the reason is because these people didn't go to church. They were the church, and they were always looking for ways to be the church. And you cannot be the church and not love people, and you cannot love people without them more, want, wanting more of that love. So as a family, we always need to be looking for opportunities to share God's love. How can we better love these kids that come to our, our meetings here at, at church and in our Sunday school and junior church time? How can we better love those parents that bring them? How can we better love our neighbors? And then there's that letter L, which stands for loving each other. This is probably the hardest part of being a family, but it's also the most important. 
And so are all the scriptures that speak specifically to how Christians are to behave towards one another, not how we are to be towards outsiders or sinners, but to other people in our own church. And these are only a few examples. The list is actually much longer because it's the single most important thing that we can do. A new command I give you, to love one another. Now, unfortunately, the spelling of the word families dictated my point structure for today, or else I would have had one point, this be one point. Because we can do this, none of the other five points are of any consequence, but I believe even possible if we don't have to love one another. Jesus didn't say it was a better way or even the best way. He said it's the only way that we can be a family of God. So what does it exactly mean to love within the context of the local church? The answer is simple. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, and it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But when there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where, while there is knowledge, it will pass away. The last letter in this word family is the letter Y. <clears throat> and it stands for being yoked together. Being yoked together has several implications for us. And it means that we all have to be pulling in the same direction, working towards the same goal or else it's counterproductive. It means we all have to pull. If we're yoked together and one person's not doing their share, and it means that the others have to pick up their slack. We all have a job to do in the family, each and every single one of us. It might not be a big job or a glamorous job, but there's not any person here in this morning that does not have a role to play in the body and in the purpose of the body. And if we're not doing it, we're cheating not only ourselves, but we're cheating each other out of that reward that God has set for us upon the faithful completion of our responsibilities. Family isn't perfect. There are flaws in every family, and yet being a family is exactly what God has called to, to us as a local church to be and it's the best thing that we could possibly be. It means that as a group, we are focused on Jesus Christ while we affirm and encourage each other, that together our lives magnify God as an act of worship, as we imagine new ways to love the lost, all while, lo all while we're loving one another, because we're yoked together, pulling for the glory of God, Genuine Christian fellowship involves much more than visiting over a cup of coffee in the church kitchen. It's loving one another, caring for one another, and bearing one another's burdens. As a family, it's our desire to see that family expanded that draws us together in unity. Today, in these unprecedented times, oh, now the media has me saying it, okay, Today, in these unprecedented times, we need family. See if there's anything that we can do. Call a friend, call someone who lives by themselves. Let them know that you are praying for them and that you would like to meet them again soon in person. Love your family and be a part of the family. It's all what God has asked us to do, amen. May the God whose community be with us as we seek to be a community. May God bless our dreams and may God shatter our dreams. May God help us to be real and to find depth in weakness and brokenness. May God help us to face and grow through conflict rather than pretend by being nice. May we look at each other through soft eyes and truly respect each other as human beings. May God help us let go of control and the need to fix one another. May God help us discover we're needy in our own souls 
and give attention to our own hearts. May God grant us that gift of extraordinary love that flows from the heart of God that covers, covers a multitude of wrongs. Amen.